Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to episode 6 of this extremely long mod spotlight covering everything you need to know about Batania. Uh, today we're going to be looking at some of the cool automation things that you can do with magic. There's a bunch of nifty stuff to check out today, uh, and then if we have time we may be jumping into some of the Ender artifacts that you can get. Uh, most of those represented in the Ender section. Whoosh! A whole bunch of stuff we haven't looked at just yet. Um, so. Lots to do still. Uh, this will probably still, in my opinion, be around a six or seven part episode. Uh, so let's get started because we got a lot to cover. Anybody who's played with a vanilla dropper before knows two things about it. One, it requires a redstone signal to drop its items. And two, it drops its items haphazardly. Sometimes it flies off to one side, sometimes it flies off to another side. These items can land all over the place, and it's quite a nuisance. Luckily, Vasky has given us an amazing little toy called the Open Crate. The open crate is really easy to make, just requires a little bit of uh, living wood, and pretty much it doesn't have a UI, so there's no interface to put items in. It also doesn't require a redstone signal uh, to drop its items. Basically, any items piped into it via a hopper or any other means will automatically fall straight down to the ground. Cool, that looks pretty good. Um, if you want to prevent this thing from running, simply apply a redstone signal, obviously, to the hopper itself um, to prevent the hopper from dropping items um, or whatever other interface. Basically, there's no way to stop the open crate from dropping items directly. However, one thing you can do if you want is uh, to apply a redstone signal to the open crate. And uh, what will happen is it'll prevent any items that drop from being picked up by flowers for a little bit longer than normal. I think it gives you an extra 10 seconds. So the open crate's a good way to feed like the coal eating flower. But if for some reason you didn't want that flower to pick up the coal or if a hopper hawk's nearby you don't want to pick up, apply a redstone signal to the open crate and it'll prevent that item from being picked up. Next up is one of my favorite items, simply because of its appearance and its complexity, and its simplicity as well. Basically, it's the hovering hourglass, and what it is is a timer. It will emit a redstone pulse after so much time has passed. The way to specify the amount of time to pass is by putting sand inside of it. For every piece of sand you put in there, uh, the timer will be one second in length. So if you right-click three pieces of sand into it, it'll run every three seconds. And every three seconds, it'll flip and emit a redstone timer and then it'll flip again. Right-clicking again will remove the sand, at which point you can specify a different amount. One piece of sand, for example, will run every one second. Nice. And it's basically a timer. Cool. Half a stack, now you've got 32 seconds between redstone pulses. If you want to have more than 64 seconds of time, use red sand. For every piece of red sand that goes in, you will get a 10 second delay. So you'll get 640 seconds if you use a full stack of red sand. Now with one piece of red sand, we've got a 10 second delay between our timer pulses. Note that you cannot mix uh, sand types. If you place soul sand in there, you will get a one minute delay. So if you have a stack of soul sand, it'll be 600 or 64 minutes, so basically about an hour. Um, so long story short, you, can, uh, mix and, you cannot mix and match your different types of sand. You can only choose one type of sand to place in there. But you've got a lot of variety for the amount of time that your timer can run. Um, another thing you can do, let's set this to like five seconds, is uh, collide this thing with a redstone or a, or a mana pulse. Whenever a mana pulse hits the timer, it will pause the timer, preventing it from continuing to run. Notice that it is now paused. If you want to unpause it, simply hit it with another burst. Cool. If you're afraid of accidentally um, clicking on this thing, just right click with a wand of the forest and it will lock it. This will prevent you from adding or removing sand from the hourglass. Right click it again with the wand to unlock it and then you can go ahead and place sand in there again. Nice. It should be noted that you can't add sand to the hourglass or remove it while there's sand in there already. Right clicking even with some sand in your inventory will remove the sand that's there. If you want to do that though, you can interact with hoppers or any other item inserting mechanism. So throw a few pieces of sand into the hopper and you'll notice that there's more sand going in. You can also hop sand out of it if you place the hopper underneath. Uh, this works for other item transfer mechanics as well. Finally, instead of placing sand in there, you can put mana powder inside. What this does now is turn the hovering hourglass into a counter instead of a timer. Basically, it'll count all the mana bursts that collide with it. So I just now placed four pieces of sand in there. If we collide it with a mana burst, we'll see that counter go up. Nice. Um, another mana burst. Another mana burst. 
And then finally, the fourth one will cause it to flip and emit its redstone signal. And again, the number of pieces of uh, mana powder that you place in there specifies the amount of mana bursts that it's going to count before emitting its redstone signal. This nifty gadget is called the Animated Torch. It also has some neat and interesting properties. Uh, if we add a little bit of redstone here, we'll notice that the Magical Torch will only emit a redstone signal in the direction that it's facing. Cool. Shift right click to have it change directions. Super awesome. You can also have this serve as a T flip flop by triggering it with a mana burst. Notice that every time a mana burst collides with uh, the torch, which it might need to be aimed a little bit better at it. There we go. Will cause the torch to turn 180 degrees. So basically flip to the other direction. Neat. You can also trigger the torch by placing a hovering hourglass next to it. And every time the torch turn or the hourglass turns, uh, the torch will T flip flop or turn 180 degrees again. You can also use a wand of the forest to change it from toggle mode, which it's currently in, to rotate mode, which means every time it gets a mana burst or is uh, gets its pulse from the hovering hourglass, it'll rotate. Neat. So you could do some pretty interesting things with this, obviously, right? You can specify how long, based on the hovering hourglass, each rotation will be. You can also set it to random mode, which means that every time it receives its mana burst or its hovering hourglass turn, it'll randomly choose one of the four cardinal directions. Sometimes it'll even stay in the same cardinal direction, because that's one of the random options. Cool, right? You guys remember the horns of the wild and the horns of the canopy? Well, we've got drum versions of those. Every time a mana burst collides with one of these drums, it'll activate and do the same thing that the horn would have done. This is the drum of the canopy, which if you don't remember, is basically like uh, the horn of the canopy, except it's going to work like a drum and uh, it picks up any leaves that are nearby. Uh, you can also use a similar one, this guy, which is the drum of the wild. If there are flowers or tall grass nearby, like there are now, um, any kind of mana burst, we'll go ahead and cause it to break. Neat. Um, I'm pretty sure that mana burst will even travel through these guys, tall grass and flowers, so it works pretty well to clear out stuff. This is especially useful if you want to set up some kind of automated farm with, um, let's say, floral fertilizer. Floral fertilizer will automatically plant down floral um, flowers. And don't forget, there's the jaded amaranthus, which will also automatically place down uh, flowers nearby. Simply pulse, and it'll automatically pick up those flowers. If you had a hopper hawk nearby, it would automatically pick up the flowers and put them in a chest. Now you've got an automated way of collecting a bunch of Batania flowers. Neat. Finally, there's the drum of the gathering. When a mana burst collides with it, it'll automatically shear any sheep that are nearby. And if there's a bucket underneath a cow, it'll milk the cow for you. Um, the bucket has to be like right under the cow, so try and keep the cow in one place. But you get the gist. So the drum of the gathering is a pretty nice way to set up an automated sheep farm if you want to get yourself a bunch of different wools. The abstruse platform is a pretty interesting block. Um, basically what it does is it treats itself as a solid block for anybody on top of it, not sneaking. If you sneak, you'll fall right through. Cool. And uh, it also is non-solid for any entities below or on the sides of it. So really it's only solid on the top. Pretty cool. You can also camouflage it by right clicking a block onto the abstruse platform. And you can right click the camouflage block to set all adjacent uh, touching abstruse platforms to match the same block. And then shift right click to remove the camouflage. It should also be noted that mana bursts have no problem traveling through abstruse platforms. The spectral platform is pretty much the same thing, except it's never a solid block. It's always going to be transparent. And uh, you can also camouflage it. <laughs> nice for making some traps for your friends. Um, you can just walk through it and it'll, you'll fall right through. It'll always be transparent to you um, and anybody for that matter. Neat. And again, shift right click to remove the effect. If you're looking for a good way to get blaze powder, go ahead and get yourself some gunpowder, rotten flesh, a bone, and some string, and you'll get a fell pumpkin. What you then need to do is get some iron bars, and place two iron bars in the world like so, and then place your fell pumpkin on top. Boom, and it'll spawn a blaze. Nice. This blaze, unlike regular blazes, uh, will drop a hefty amount of blaze powder instead of blaze rods. 
the Cocoon of Caprice. Pretty interesting block. When you place it down in the world, it'll start to wobble. And uh, it has a chance of spawning pretty much any kind of baby animal. Usually it'll be farm animals, but sometimes you can get things like wolves and horses. Also, it says that giving it an emerald will influence the outcome towards something a bit different. I wonder what that could be. The Ender Overseer, pretty nifty block. Um, basically, if any player within 64 block radius is looking at it, it emits a redstone signal. You guys have seen me use this in prior Let's Play series to create a door. Um, so basically, you can use this to look at the block and it'll open a door and keep it open for a little bit using something, um, you know, some redstone timer contraption. The Eye of the Ancients is a great way to keep track of how many animals you have nearby. Oh look, my cocoon turned into a baby cow, neat. Um, so basically, you place a comparator next to the Eye of the Ancients, and then you place some redstone off of there. What this is going to do is automatically count any nearby animals in about a six block radius. So this cow might count. Um, it starts counting at two, so provided that this cow is close enough, uh, we place down a second cow and it'll emit a redstone signal of one. A third cow, redstone signal of two, etc., etc., etc. The Spectral Rail, really neat little device. It's basically um, gives some of the neat spectral platform abilities to your carts on rails. Anytime a cart collides with this rail, it's going to automatically turn it into a specter. What this does is send the cart flying, and it'll also be able to travel through solid blocks like stone. If it collides with another track in the world, it's going to go ahead and stop and land on the track. Let's see what happens. Uh, we're gonna activate this guy, and you'll notice it goes flying through that solid block and lands on the car track on the other side. Neat. The car will also stop if it lands or collides on any variant of Dreamwood, so keep that in mind. The Teru Teru Bozu. Pretty neat little device. Um, what this does is it's a uh, spirit that can manage weather, uh, specifically bad weather. A, simply placing one in the world will reduce the likelihood that it's going to rain or uh, decrease the amount of time that rain and snowstorms will last. Also, during bad weather, it's going to emit a redstone signal indicating, uh, if you have a comparator on it, that it's raining. And hey, all of a sudden, it's sunny again. Finally, if you want, you can right-click the Tero Tero Bozu with a sunflower or just drop it on it and it'll automatically switch it to normal sunny weather. Cool. We already briefly took a look at the force relay, which you can bind to another block in the world so that when a piston pushes the force relay, it will push the other block as well. Pretty neat. Uh, it should be noted that uh, the force relay will not be stuck to a sticky piston and that if a sticky piston were to push the force relay, it does not push the attached block. Neat. The next item to show you is the crafting crate. This is a pretty nifty block. Basically, it's a block that does not have a UI that you can use for auto crafting. It's pretty cool. Um, basically, what you need to do is pipe items into it, and each item that goes in lands into a specific inventory slot of the crafting um, crate. There's also crafting placeholders that when those get piped in, they're treated like empty spots. So basically, if you want to create something like a pickaxe, you need to put those crafting placeholders in the slots that don't have items. Now, it should be noted that like the open crate, where its namesake comes from, it will drop items underneath it. So make sure there's an open spot for that. Um, basically, the way this works is we pipe items in with a hopper. And if you look inside the book here, it'll explain to you. Uh, remember, crafting placeholders go in empty slots. You need to pipe items in in the correct order. Um, we'll talk about what the Wand of the Forest can do in a moment. Um, what we have here is basically nine slots in a crafting table, and the order that you pipe items into this matters. So the first three items that get piped in go into the top three slots in order one, two, and three. And then the fourth item goes here, the fifth here, the sixth there, etc. So if you wanted to craft a diamond pickaxe, you would pipe in one, two, three diamonds, then a crafting placeholder, which is basically an empty inventory slot, a stick, another crafting placeholder for empty, another crafting placeholder for empty, then another stick, and then another crafting placeholder. Let's give it a try. So three diamonds, followed by a placeholder, so that's one, two, and three, right? Then placeholder, stick, placeholder, placeholder, stick, placeholder, and then another placeholder, stick, placeholder. And then boom, it automatically drops the items on the ground, and we got ourselves a diamond pickaxe, and we also got our placeholders back. Neat. Placeholders are actually really easy to make. You get half a stack of them for just a crafting table and some living rock. Nice. Um, you can also hit this thing um, 
with a wand and you can see what's currently in there as well. So for example, we place our three diamonds in there and we'll see the three diamonds. Um, if we place our crafting placeholder stick crafting placeholder and right click, what it will do is try to craft what's already in there. If it can't craft anything, you get all your items back. Neat, right? So let's put the one, two, three back in there and then placeholder stick placeholder placeholder stick. So currently we've got that recipe. This will actually craft the pickaxe because the pickaxe recipe is valid. Neat. Say for example that you wanted to craft wood, right? So we would just place a piece of wood in there and it would be, as you can see, we right click and it'll craft. Remember you can use dispensers to automate the right clicking uh, of items with the wand of the forest. Neat. One other feature of this is that if you place a comparator on the side, it'll output a redstone signal, letting you know how many items are inside the crafty crate. So when we place our one piece of oak wood in there, we can use that redstone signal that says one to trigger the auto crafting. If we had um, the desire to make, let's say, uh, pressure plates, right? One, two, now there's two pieces of wood in there, we're emitting a signal strength of two, we can say, hey, we've got two items in there, we know we're ready to craft, go ahead and trigger the right click, and we get ourselves a pressure plate. Pretty cool, right? So with that mechanic, the open crate is really kind of an interesting way to auto craft items. If you feed the items in the right order, then you're definitely gonna have uh, whatever crafting recipe you want. And you can totally use this to craft literally anything in the game. You just have to be smart about the order that you pipe items into it. There are two catalysts that are available in Batania that modify the attributes of the mana pool. As we know, typically dropping items into a mana pool like diamonds will get you a mana diamond, which is neat. However, having the alchemy catalyst underneath a mana pool will modify the attributes of the mana pool, allowing it to catalyze and turn some items into other items. Most of the recipes can be found in here. So for example, with an alchemy catalyst under the pool, you can drop zombie flesh into the pool to get yourself some leather, and it works pretty much just like making the diamond. So you drop your flesh in there and you can see that the recipe shows. If you don't have an alchemy catalyst under here, this won't work and it won't do anything. Cool. Uh, so simply place your alchemy catalyst back underneath and you can now craft leather into diamond. There's a bunch of different recipes to check out. You can convert um, different saplings into each other, same for different types of wood. Uh, you can also turn glowstone into glowstone dust. A handful of things can be done uh, using the catalyst. Cool. Uh, the other kind of catalyst that exists is the conjuration catalyst. For a hefty amount of mana, you can duplicate some items directly using mana. So basically it uses mana to duplicate items. It's pretty cool. Um, you can drop redstone in there and you'll get two redstone. Same for glowstone, quartz, and coal, snow, netherrack. And you can see there's different varying amounts of redstone or mana that are going to be required to do this duplicating. Neat. Um, so for example, we've got 63 redstone. Drop one in. Now we've got 64. Cool. Uses a hefty amount of reds of uh, mana, so do you know keep that in mind. But if you have a good mana setup, it's definitely worth trying. Those who play vanilla Minecraft, all of you, uh, know that there are two other things you can do magically in vanilla Minecraft, and of course, Batania adds magical ways to go about doing them. Those are brewing, which there's a botanical brewery and then enchanting. We're gonna check out the two of those things now. So the botanical brewery is pretty cool. Basically you feed it mana and give it items and it'll be able to create potions for you, much like the potions that you can make with the vanilla brewery. Um, so in order to get this, you're gonna need some vials, a mana glass vial, which is with three mana glass, and you can also get elf glass vials, which can hold more. And then there's a bunch of potions you can get. Uh, so for example, if you want a speed effect, you can go ahead and brew yourself the brew of fleet feet. Um, basically place nether wart, sugar, and redstone on here, and you've got it. Brew of the Vigor gives you strength. Let's try that one. Nether wart, blaze powder, and glowstone. As mentioned, you can either use vials or elf glass flasks. Elf glass flasks are elf glass, which you get from dropping mana glass into an elven trade mana portal. Uh, mana glass coming from glass on a mana pool. Cool. Um, once you've crafted those, you first place the elf glass flask on here, and then you place the three items that are going to make up your potion. One, two, three. Boom. Mana will start infusing it, and you can see if you hold the wand of the forest how far along this progress is. Ta-da! You've got your flask of the vigor, which has a bunch of uses on it. Six uses. Nice. So unlike a vanilla potion where, you know, if you think about it, you really get three uses, um, you get three separate items that can be used once. This one with the elf glass gives you six uses or five uses. It's, it's pretty darn cool. 
Nice. You should note that aside from the normal potion effects that you can get, uh, there's a few other nifty ones that are pretty cool. Uh, if you were to go through here, you'd find them listed under Complex Brews. Complex Brews, basically you add a bunch more items to it and you get some nifty effects on them. So for example, the Vial of Overload gives you some strong strength and speed, but also gives you weakness and hunger. Um, the Brew of the Crossed Souls gives you Soul Cross. Um, with this Brew's effect, we'll regain HP whenever they slay any other creature. Cool. Um, this one will be completely immune to any fall damage. So there's a bunch of like advanced potions that you can make. It's pretty neat. You can also make incense sticks. Basically, these are pretty much the same as potion effects, but they work in a small area of effect, kind of like a vanilla beacon. Uh, so if you were to get yourself uh, your um, blaze powder again, and nether wart, and glowstone, and place them on here, you'd notice that for what looks to be a pretty heftier cost of mana, you can get an incense stick infused with the appropriate ability. Once you've got your incense, go ahead and create yourself an incense plate. When you place the incense stick on it, an adjacent comparator will emit a redstone signal of one. Right clicking it with a flint and steel or um, hitting it with a mana burst that has the kindle lens on it will cause it to light up. Boom. And once it's lit, the comparator will be emitting a signal strength of two, and any players nearby will get the strength potion effect. This lasts a lot longer than a potion, but it will eventually burn out. You can pipe incense into these things with hoppers. We already took a look at blood pendants in a previous spotlight, and these are crafted in much the same way. You place the tainted blood pendant on the pedestal of the botanical brewery, and then add the potion effects you want it to have, and it'll work from your bauble slot to give you that potion effect all the time at the cost of mana from your inventory. You can also do some enchanting with Batania, and it's actually pretty cool. Let's go ahead and clear out and make this uh, multi-block structure that the book told us about. You guys have seen multiple times now how to go ahead and create these. So first, form a cross with obsidian like that. Place a lapis block on top. Then get yourself some mystical flowers of any kind and plant them in the four corners. Cool. Further away, you're going to be planting mystical flowers underneath some mana pylons. One, two, three on this side. And then one, two, three on this side. There we go. Structure complete. Nice. Hit the lapis block in the center with your wand to turn it into a mana enchanter. Sweet. This enchanting process is going to require mana. You can either feed it with mana burst, which is slow, or place a spark on top of the mana enchanter, uh, which will be fast. Note, to place the spark on top of the mana enchanter, you want to shift right click. Uh, once you've decided what you want to enchant, first get the item and right click it on the altar. It's going to go ahead and start floating there. Then you want to drop any books nearby that you want to enchant it with. So for in this case, we're going to use Fortune 3. You can place multiple blocks or, uh, or multiple books around this thing, but if you were to place uh, books with multiple enchants on them, only the first enchant will count. Uh, once this is placed nearby and you have all the books near that you want, uh, so let's maybe get efficient Sure, why not? Uh, right click on the mana enchanter. Cool. And it'll start the enchanting process. Mana will be gotten from the mana pool, and the mana pylons will help to augment this. Woot. Obviously, the more mana pools with sparks nearby, the faster this will go. Uh, the more enchants that you're trying to put on your device and the more rare the enchants are, the longer this will take and the more mana it will be required. Eventually, the process is completed and you'll be able to get your item back. Nice. Uh, you won't be able to get your item back without uh, it being finished. So if the process is still going, you can't get it back while it's running. But notice we now have a diamond pickaxe with fortune three and efficiency five. The best part about this is it didn't use up our books. So we can save these books and use them again later. How cool is that? It should be noted that at any time, if any part of the structure is interrupted, it'll convert the mana enchanter in the center back to a regular lapis block. Simply reform the structure as it should be, and then right click again with the wand of the forest to turn it back into a mana enchanter. Don't forget to put your spark back. And with that guys, I think we've reached a good wrapping up point for 
episode 6 of the Batania Mod Spotlight. We've seen a bunch of stuff today, a bunch of cool items and gadgets, and also how to enchant and brew potions with mana. Um, the next and probably final part will cover some of the ender mechanics, like red string, luminizers, and the corporeal system. Hopefully, we can also squeeze in some of the relics and other cool gadgets that are available. But from what I recall, the relic system is pretty complicated and the corporeal system is pretty complicated, so we may squeeze all that into one episode, or there may be two remaining. We'll just have to wait and see. There's also the Garden of Glass system, which we haven't talked about, which is its own special game mode and how you can enable it. So there's a bunch of cool stuff that we will be talking about in at least the next one or two parts of the Batania Mod Spotlight. For now, Daryl20 is signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and as always, take it easy!